Hey y'all, time for another book review. Got a really good one for you today. And I'm gonna say the haunted house genre is probably, probably my favorite subgenre of horror. So anything that purports to be a haunted house story with kind of a twist or a little bit of a fresh take on it. I really like classic haunted house stories, but I really like to see what people can do within the genre. So um, I will say that this is a very interesting and sort of a fresh take on a haunted house story. This is 12 Nights at Rotter House by J.W. Ocker. Now, I'm really, I'm conflicted because this book has a twist ending and it's really hard to, I don't know, like I, I feel like, just, so just tread carefully because I am going to, just like some on some of my other reviews, even if I don't spoil the ending outright, and if I, if I get to that point and I just decide and I chicken out, <laughs> I just like don't say what the ending is, then no, even if I don't do that, then there might be some plot developments that you don't want spoiled. So if you haven't read this book and you really want to read this book and you don't want to know anything that happens in it, then obviously uh, you might want to read the book first and then come back and talk about it because I'm not making any promises over whether I spoil it or not. As I said, I don't script these. I basically just read the book and then turn on the camera and talk about it. it. It all depends on when I get there, when I, you know, what in the book discussion, when I get there, I'm like, well, should I say what happens at the end so I can kind of talk about the feels I had about it. So we'll see how it goes from there. So this book came out in 2019. Now the author, J.W. Ocker, I didn't know this and I haven't read any of his sort of nonfiction books, but apparently he's quite well known for doing essentially what the protagonist of this novel does. He goes to creepy haunted places and writes about them. It's, he's like a travel writer, but with a paranormal or, you know, a ghost story sort of spin to it. So that's kind of what you have in your main character. Now, the main character is named Felix Alsey. And in the universe of the book, he has written several books going to these haunted locations and writing essentially a travel log about them. And they've sold sort of enough for him to make a little bit of a living, but not really. Uh, I guess there's, there's some stuff in there about his wife, Elsa, who uh, I guess a lot of the stuff is, you know, based on her salary. So he's kind of feeling bad about it. And he wants that one book that's just gonna, you know, blow the doors off and, you know, make him kind of a household name. So how he thinks he's going to do that is there's a house, I, I don't know if it's near where he lives or it's like, it doesn't really matter, but there was this house that he heard about and it was kind of a more obscure haunted house and he can't understand why it's so obscure because it's really super creepy looking and a bunch of really, really horrible shit happened there. There was a lot of murders and suicides, murder suicides, uh, you know, a serial killer hunt, like used it as hideout for a while and stuff like that. So it all kind of like terrible things happened there. The guy that built the house I think his name was A.L. Rotterdam, essentially called Rotterdam Manor or Rotterdam Mansion. But because it got a reputation for being creepy and haunted, it started getting called Rotter House. So the guy that built the house was much like this reminded me very much of uh, Legend of Hell House. Uh, and Hell House, the book that it was based on by Richard Matheson, where the dude that built the house was kind of a... I guess you'd call him like a sex addict or something like where he had essentially a harem of women and he would have all these women in there and doing all these things to them. So that it got a reputation because of that. And then later on it became a brothel and then it became like even a worse brothel. And then there was, you know what I mean? So there, so there was all kind of backstory to the house. They don't go a huge amount into it. A lot of it is suggestion, but I kind of like the way that was done. They don't do a big exposition dump um, you know, there are some times where he's talking about this is the room where this happened, but they don't go super, super into exactly what happened in the house. It's just a lot of it's just suggestion or just mentioned uh, just to give you kind of a background of this house had a really sordid history and is supposedly all full of ghosts. So what Felix is going to do, and this novel is written in the first person. He thinks the book that's going to make his name, he wants to do a travelogue type book but one with a twist or one with an edge. 
He's like, basically, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take Rotter House, this house, it's abandoned, it's owned by somebody who is, you know, the, the owner of the house is saying that they're going to, you know, fix it up and resell it or turn it into something, like turn it into a bed and breakfast or, or a haunted attraction or something like that. That's They don't really go a lot into that either, but that seems to be the implication. So he wants to stay in this house and essentially treat the house like an immersion tank where he is going to go in this house for 13 days and he's not going to leave. He's not going to have a cell phone. He's not going to do, he's basically taking a box of research into shit that happened in the house. He's taking a few other things. He's taking like a whole bunch of food and bedding and all that kind of crap uh, that you would take if you were going camping or whatever. And he's just going to basically stay in this house for 13 days and write about his experiences. So he thinks that this is gonna be kind of a fresh take on the genre. So there's a little bit of back and forth in the beginning uh, where the woman who owns the house really doesn't wanna let him in there and she's being, uh, you know, <laughs> he keeps calling her a bastard uh, because she doesn't wanna let him in there. But eventually he does get into the house. Now, one thing that I love about this book being called 12 Nights at Rotter House is that very early on it's established that his book that he's writing in the book is called 13 Nights at Rotter House. So you know that something is gonna go drastically awry and the whole shit is gonna be cut short. So I like that even from the first few pages, you have that suspense going on because you know, cause it's kind of put into sections where it's like night one, you know, all this happened and then night two. So those are kind of like the chapters. So you know that like when night 12 comes that some bad shit's gonna go down. So you're kind of like constantly going toward that motion. So like I said, it's, it's really good suspense. Now, he stays there one night, but then the next day, it turns out that to make this book more interesting, he has asked his childhood friend, Thomas, to stay in the house with him. Now, this is for several reasons. Felix is a skeptic of the paranormal. Um, he does not believe in ghosts. He doesn't believe in anything like that. And he's very, very adamant about it. He's really into horror movies and he's really into horror tropes. So he wants to, ascend. it's not even like, I don't know if I want to say this, but it's almost kind of like he's daring this house to prove that it's haunted type of thing because he wants to go in this house and do all the regular shit that you would do in a haunted house story. You know, he's got the Ouija board. He's got some of the ghost hunting shit. He's got all this kind of stuff. So he's trying to like stir shit up because he's almost kind of like, you know, show me. I will, you know, I'm a skeptic. I don't believe anything is going to happen. But he also wants his friend Thomas there for one reason, because Thomas is a believer in ghosts. And uh, he really thinks this whole thing is maybe a bad idea. And maybe they shouldn't be fucking with a Ouija board. And maybe they shouldn't be calling these ghosts out and all this other kind of stuff. So there's a good conflict there. But also these two friends, they're both big horror movie fans and some of the best stuff in the book, some of the most fun stuff in the book, because this is a really fun book. It's a fun read. There's creepy shit in it too. But I, I think fun is the main adjective that I would use to describe this. It's just a really entertaining read. And a lot of the entertainment comes from the humor as I said, this is written in the first person from Felix's point of view, and he's a funny guy, and he's really into horror movies, and his friend Thomas is also really into horror movies, and even though they're coming at things from sort of a conflicting philosophical worldview, if you want to go that deep with it, where he's very, very skeptical of the paranormal and Thomas is not, they still have a really deep and abiding friendship, and they have a lot of fun with all their horror trivia. Like, they, a couple times in the book, they play this basically this game. Oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's called film something film, film fight. I think it's called film fight. There we go. And uh, where they basically are like, okay, uh, every movie that you can think of that has a Ouija board in it. And then it just goes back and forth. And they have to like come up with all the movies they can think of that had a Ouija board in them. And so all this kind of shit is really fun. And there's so, so, so many horror references in this. And some people might think it's a little excessive because it's like, oh my, oh man, you know, knock it off. But I found it really, really fun, really, really entertaining. I think my favorite shout out was when they go down in the basement and they find kind of all these uh, like animatronic monsters and stuff because they're like, oh, maybe the, you know, maybe the owner is trying to make it into a haunted attraction, like when it's all fixed up or whatever. So they're like werewolves and shit like that down there. And there's one zombie animatronic down there that he 
compares to Dr. Freudstein from Lucio Fulci's House by the Cemetery. And that's how that figure is referred to, like for the rest of the book is Dr. Freudstein. So I don't know, I, I found that really amusing. But so obviously, J.W. Ocker, the author, is really, really into horror movies and really into kind of obscure horror movies. So I really liked that aspect of it. This is, I will say, if you don't like meta horror, this does have a very, very strong meta aspect. It's very self-aware. These two characters, even though one's a skeptic and one's not, they are both really into horror movies and horror literature and know a lot about it. They're like geeks about it, essentially. And they talk a lot about it and they talk a lot about haunted house tropes and they talk about subverting them. So they have a lot of discussions over the 12 nights that they're in this house about different films. Like, you know, it, is this something we should be doing? Oh, we're splitting up right now. That means that this is going to happen. And then they'll like reference some other movie. So if you don't like meta stuff, you might not, you might not enjoy it as much as somebody that does. But I, I really like meta horror if it's done well. And I think this was really done well because this is also a really entertaining story on top of being sort of meta, self -re self referential, self aware, that type of stuff. Um, but I'm just warning you if you don't like meta horror, you might not dig it the same way I did. So these two friends are in this house and there's no electricity, there's no water. Apparently, when he conceived the project and that he was going to be staying in this house for almost two weeks, he thought that the house had electricity, but then when he got there and used up the last of his cell phone, because like I said, he was just let his cell phone battery die because he wanted it to be like a, an immersion experience and like no, no influence from the outside world. Um, he was led to believe that there would be electricity, but he calls the owner and she's like, oh no, you know, it, it doesn't have any electricity. I believe it did have some running water, but the water was kind of brown and gross. Um, but he brought lots of booze, so it was fine. <laughs> So these two guys, as I said, have been friends, I believe since high school, and uh, their wives are also friends with each other. So all four of them, you know, the two couples are, you know, very close friends. However, something happened a year ago that really put a massive rift in their friendship. And it must have been something really bad because they didn't speak about it for a year. And Felix expresses surprise that when he reached out to Thomas, and asked him to be on this project with him that he accepted. So you're led to believe that Thomas wants to repair this rift in their friendship over whatever it was that happened a year ago that was apparently very terrible. And so that's kind of another thing too, like the connection between these two men trying to reconnect with one another. Now for a long time, you don't know what the terrible thing was that happened. Uh, between the two of them that severed their friendship, you do find out later on in the book. And that's kind of where that's the point at which everything starts going fucking crazy up in the shit. But I think the heart of this book is the relationship between the two of them, because you're seeing everything from Felix's point of view. And just the way they talk the way he thinks about his friend, the way they talk to one another, I think that's really, really well done. And because essentially these are the only two characters in the entire book. I mean, they talk about their wives a little bit, but you don't ever get to see them or talk to them. The only other person that has any dialogue or any, you know, screen time, if you want to call it that, in the book is the owner of Rotter House. And that's literally like the first two pages and then you never hear from her again, really. Um, so at the very, very beginning and the very, very end, there are a couple other people. But other than that, the, a whole, the entirety of the book is just these two men interacting with each other and interacting with this house. So over the course of the two weeks that they are staying in this house, essentially camping out, as I said, because Felix's book he wants to do something different every day. Let's today, let's do Ouija board. You know, tomorrow let's do, I don't think they did EVP or anything, but they, you know, they do things like that, that ghost hunter people or that people that are in haunted houses would do because they want some shit to happen. Now for a long time, nothing really happens or nothing happens that is it that doesn't have like plausible deniability. You know what I'm saying? Because I think the first things that happen when they're doing the Ouija board is they start hearing these really loud cracking noises and they can't figure out where they're coming from. Like these cracks are really loud, like so loud that they shake the whole house and the cracks seem to be moving through the house as though 
because they're doing the Ouija board up in the attic as though the cracking noise is leading them down to the cellar. So there's that, but, you know, Felix basically says, well, that could be something natural, even though it's very, very loud and it's very weird, but that's not unarguably supernatural. So things kind of go on from there where they just hear funny noises, kind of like, you know, creaking floorboards, really loud cracks. Felix actually on the first night he's there before, like right before Thomas arrives, he has a really bad, he doesn't see anything, but he kind of sees all these nightmarish images in his mind's eye, which gives him sort of a panic attack. So there's that kind of stuff. So it's little things, loud cracks. He thinks when he's in bed one night that he's hold, like he dreams that he's holding his wife's hand, but when he wakes up, he still feels as though he's holding someone's hand, but there's no one there, which is very haunting of Hill House because that happens in that novel as well. So it's little things, but then, you get to a point where you can't deny that this shit is haunted anymore. And Felix actually sees, at first he sees a figure and it just kind of passes by a door and he can tell that it's a woman, but he can't see her face. He's like, the only impression I got was that she was, I think the word he used was flowy, like something was flowing along behind her, like hair or clothing or something but he didn't see her face. So for a long time, they're trying to figure out who this ghost might be. Because as I said, many people died in this house. And one of the very amusing things is that when Felix and Thomas first start exploring the house, Felix has done all of this research about the house. And so he knows all of the horrible shit that has happened in each bedroom. Cause this is a massive house. It has, I don't even remember how many bedrooms it has, but it's a lot. And so he writes down on a piece of paper. He's like, this is the dismemberment room. And this is the hanging suicide room or whatever. So he like marks them all, to, you know, um, in regards to whatever horrible thing happened in that particular room, because something horrible happened in every single room. So he's almost not, he's not really taking it seriously. It's almost kind of like a lark to him. So, you know, it, 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 he has like kind of a morbid sense of humor about it. So he's doing that kind of stuff. So they're trying to figure out, they're like, because Felix is saying all of the stuff that supposedly happened in this house, all of these horrific murders, it's very difficult to find because a lot of them happened so long ago, it's very difficult to find any independent sources for these. So some of them may be urban legends. However, one murder, a double murder or murder suicide, they're not entirely sure what, happened in 1984, and he does have a lot of documentation for that. And this was a case of this couple that stayed in this one room where he actually ends up sleeping, uh, you know, one of the master bedrooms. And they found these two in bed, and they had basically looked like they had cut each other up, like cut each other to pieces, and they couldn't really figure out why or if someone else did it or if they did it to each other or, or what it was. So it was like a really, really weird, like unsolved murder. So for a long time, this female ghost that he sees, he thinks that 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 it's the woman of, you know, part of this couple. So they keep expecting like the dude ghost to show up. But then it so happens, as I said, when he sees the apparition the first time, he can't tell what she looks like. And then she shows up pretty much big as life and twice as ugly. And I will say that the imagery of this imagining what this ghost would look like legitimately creeped me out. Like, because after I read this book, because this book, as I said, it's super fun. It's super entertaining. And it really, I read it almost all in one sitting, which I say a, lo a lot about some of the books on here, but not always. But this one was just a breeze. I just breezed through it. I was having a blast. But after I finished reading the bulk of it and I was going to bed and I got up in the middle of the night, like to go to the bathroom or something. And I was thinking about what that ghost must look like. And I was like, oh, like I didn't want to look in the mirror. So basically he calls this ghost the split faced woman. And he essentially walks into her at one time, as in he's walking down the hall and he just walks in and suddenly he's in the middle of this skin, he can see her pulsing brain, like her face is split open. He can see bone and brain and everything. And just the way it's described in the book just really freaked me out. I don't know why. Now, 
it's strange because so he sees this apparition more than once and he's he keeps arguing with Thomas. He's like, this must be some other murder victim because this doesn't look anything like the woman that died here in 1984, who we're, who we're assuming that it is. So he's trying to come up with a narrative. It's really interesting because, because he's coming at things from a skeptical point of view, even when he sees the ghost, he acknowledges that it's a ghost and him and Thomas get into a lot of arguments about this because Thomas is like, dude, you walked into a ghost and you're still like hanging out here and not taking it entirely seriously because it's almost like Felix is not kind of like, oh, hey, cool, because he's scared, but it's almost like he wants to get to the bottom of it. He wants to find some narrative. Why is this ghost here? What's going on? And he's dead set on finishing this book because he thinks that this book is going to save everything. It's going to save his marriage. It's going to save, you know, his his financial future. It's going to you know, make him feel like he's not useless anymore. So this is, he's right, everything is riding on this project. So he's very, very loath to, even after Thomas is freaking out, he's like, we got to get out of here. Like when really horrible shit starts to happen, he just, he's very, very reluctant to leave. Now, so it starts going on like that. They're trying to figure out who this ghost is. And on the 12th night, or actually maybe it's on the 11th night, Thomas seems to disappear for, I believe, 24 hours, and then reappears again. And after this point, after his reappearance, is when the twist happens. Okay, so I decided, now that I got to this uh, point in the video, I decided I'm not going to spoil what the twist is. Now, I did not see it coming. However, some other reviewers that I read did see it coming, so I'm not going to say, oh, you won't see it coming or it'll just, it'll blindside you or whatever. I'm not going to say that because I did see some reviewers that said, oh, I figured it out earlier. I did not because I guess I was just so wrapped up in the escalating haunting and I was wrapped up in the characterization of these two men and wondering what had happened between them a year ago that messed up their friendship so badly that, the, you know, the the way that Felix was thinking about it. And I was like, man, this must have been really terrible. So I was just so wrapped up in all of that. And in Felix's interior monologue, how he felt about the book, how he felt about the haunting getting worse, you know, how he was coming at it. Is this, this is going to change my whole entire worldview. Do I have to believe in Bigfoot now? It's like he gets into that kind of, and I thought it was like really realistic because that's probably, probably what, you know, me as a skeptic, if I was staying at a haunted house, I feel like his thought process, processes about it were very similar to probably what mine would have been. So I could really relate to him as a character. So, at the point when Thomas reappears in the house, and as I said, there is a twist. I, okay, I will say for a minute, maybe two minutes, when I realized what was going on, what the twist was, for a minute or two, I went, oh, are we doing this? But then I was all right with it. So I'm not really sure how you're going to feel, but it's not the most original twist and as I said, you might be able to see it coming if you're picking up on different clues that I'm picking up on. I did not see it coming. And for, uh, you know, a fraction of time, I was kind of like, oh, is it going to do? But then I was like, oh, you know what? No, it's OK. Because the more I thought about the twist, the more I thought back to all the shit that had happened in the book. And I was like, oh, oh, OK. I was like, I see what he was setting up the whole time. And I didn't see it. So good one. So this is definitely a book that I will reread because after I finished reading it for a day or two after, I kept thinking, oh, I kept thinking of all these details in the earlier part of the book. And I was like, oh, I was like, oh, shit. Why didn't I even see that? I should have totally seen that ending coming. And I didn't. So the way that it was written was really skillful from, I, I thought, because as I said, I didn't really see it coming. But after you know what the ending is, you kind of go back and think of all the details and be like, oh, oh, I see what he was getting at with that. I see. So as I said, this is definitely one I want to read a second time because I want to, 
I like to do that with um, stuff that I really enjoyed that had kind of a twist ending that I didn't see coming. I like to reread it a second time so I can pick up all the shit that I lost because I think it gives a richer appreciation of the writer's craft of planting all these clues in there and seeing if you can figure out what the twist is going to be. It's not so much like a puzzle or anything like that, but I just really liked it was just very satisfying to me to think about, oh, that's why that ghost looked like that. That's why this happened. That's why this happened. And it's it's just really satisfying for me to think of all the stuff and think about how it was all set up and how how the trick was done, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Even though, as I said, even without the twist, I think that this book would have still been a blast. I thought it was really, really fun. It's funny. And it also is really creepy. Like it has some really creepy imagery, some really creepy descriptions of what the inside of the house looks like. It's very claustrophobic because other than one scene at the very beginning, the entire thing takes place in this house, which there's no electricity. So it's just dark. So they're just creeping around with flashlights and lanterns all the time. So it's very, very oppressive. But also I really liked the two characters. And I think these were the perfect two characters to put in a situation like this, in a novel like this, because you had such a good time. I mean, seriously, I could have read a whole book of just them shooting the shit about horror movies. You know what I mean? So even if you didn't have all the other creepy ghost shit, it could have just been a whole book of these two guys and like they're in this house and nothing happened. You know what I mean? (laughs) That was like a novel about that. It didn't need all this stuff with the ghosts and everything, but I'm glad it had that because that shit was creepy and that was really cool. But I'm just saying it didn't need that because the characterization was so good. And you, and I had such a good time with these two characters that I was, you know, going on a journey with it and it was just really cool. So as I said, If you like haunted house stories, if you like meta stories, if you like stuff that is creepy, but also really funny and references a lot of other horror movies and is doing something not completely original, but a little bit original with the haunted house genre and with all the haunted house tropes. And if you like a good twist ending, as I said, not the most original twist ending, but you know, what is? Um, So if you like anything like that, then please, please uh, pick up 12 Nights at Rotter House by J.W. Ocker. It's really, really fun. And I really had a good time reading this one. And as I said, this will be a definite reread probably sometime later this year. And uh, if I get any new insights when I read it a second time, uh, maybe I'll make a new video. So we'll see. But yeah, thanks for tuning in this time. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye.